Well, in Luke chapter 13, as we've read through here, and hopefully uh, next week you'll read through uh, chapter 14 and uh, come prepared. In verses 1 through 5, we see there was this present season. Don't know necessarily, I think it's different. It's not a continuation from chapter 12. Remember, uh, chapter and verse was put in later with the special with the onset of the printing press and it made just things easier. So sometimes you can get lost. But chapter 13 actually goes all the way into chapter 14. And so there's a continuing scene back here. But chapter 13, there was this, at this present uh, season, some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled uh, with their sacrifices. If you're in the chronological order here, we're in the last six months of Jesus' life from this point on. This is the, it's already been going around. He's already been ministering for about three years. And so, again, statements that will be said... Three years of walking with Jesus, we're going to see other statements where, again, the disciples are continuing to arguing of who's going to be greatest in the kingdom. Didn't they already like approach that subject a while back? Didn't Jesus already talk to him about those things? So again, this is where in the last six months of Jesus' life uh, here, and again, it's already been said as we've studied in the weeks past, is that he's already set his face towards Jerusalem. When he goes into Jerusalem this next time, he, he is going there to die and be the Savior of the world. He's going there to pay the price for yours and I's sin. And so, he's now, uh, again, they're bringing him this, uh, this situation. These religious Jews are saying, Hey, look, do you remember when the, Pilate, uh, I mean, uh, when the blood of these Galileans, uh, that Pilate had mingled in the sacrifices? Uh, we don't know exactly what the situation was. We know, uh, again, from other history that there were some who were riding in Jerusalem who were demanding certain things, and Pilate had sent out uh, uh, spies, or he sent out people masquerading as Jews. And at the given time, they had pulled out their daggers and they had killed them, and therefore that uh, whole protest ended rather quickly. But we don't know what happened in, in, the, in the Galilean here. But the question is coming out here in verses 1 through 5 is, why do bad things happen to good people or was it expected? There is, again, this mentality and this false theology, this study of God, theology of God and the study of God, that if the bad things happen to you, well, then you must deserve it. Oh, you, you can look at that as far as in Hindu, Hinduism as well, and Zoism, where, again, you must accept this and embrace this. Also in fatalistic Calvinism, if these things bad happen to you, that was destined and that was God's will, and you need to accept that. I don't suggest this. Sometimes I threaten people who be that way, say, well, I'm going to punch you, I'm going to break your nose right now, and there's nothing you can do about it, because I'm destined to do it. All right? It's just, you have to accept it. I mean, I would like not to. I mean, I, if I had a choice in the matter... But it, I am compelled to do this, and I must, I must do it. Tell that to the police officer when you run the red light. You don't understand. It was foreordained before the foundations of the world for me to go through here, and you really can't argue it. I mean, do you understand that whole fatalistic end view of that whole thing? It, it is sad, funny, but there are people who feel that way. Again... So they do these things. So these southern Jews, these Jerusalem Jews, are saying, well... You know, about the Galileans. Look, Jesus says to them, says, Do you suppose these Galileans were worse sinners than all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I mean, Jesus is answering this question that they're posing. They're like, look at these things. And, and, and the northern Galilee part is also known as the Galilee of the Gentiles. Of course those bad things would happen. And there's a lot of Gentiles up there. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, of course these things. People are intermingled with it. And of course these bad things would happen. Look, you know, they, they get what they deserve. Well, then Jesus says, then I tell you, uh, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 whom on the tower in Siloam fell and killed them. Siloam is in Jerusalem. Now we have the works of antiquities of Josephus and we have other archaeological and uh, uh, ascertained fact. There was a tower being built around the Pool of Siloam and, and it did fall and it did kill people. But, but he's bringing this whole thing. You say the, 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 it should have happened to those bad people. It should have happened to those bad people. But what about here in Jerusalem? Are, you know, aren't they supposed to be better? I mean, you're in the fact that you're in Jerusalem. You know, that is a mentality that's even here today. As we tour Israel and we go there, the, the further you are away from uh, Jerusalem, the religious elitist Jews who don't leave Jerusalem say there is no Jews outside Jerusalem. 
Israel has a mentality of Tel Aviv is this very secular city. Tel Aviv is where you work. Next major city is Elat. That's where you go to play. That's the southern tip of Israel there on the Red Sea. And Jerusalem is where you go to pray. That's how people describe uh, in, in Israel uh, that nation. And so here, this mentality is still going on uh, to this day. And so here, Jesus is saying, were they any worse? Were any worse sinners? I mean, there were sinners in Galilee. But understand this. They're asking a quintessential question. What about the starving people group in some other country who've never heard Jesus? Never heard the name of Jesus. You know, what, what about them? What about these things that are going on? And look at Jesus' answer, which number one, if you're taking notes, is the question for each and every one of us here today. I tell you, verse 3, in, uh, no, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Forget this whole separation of the, you know, the northern Galileans, the cities of the Gentiles, oh, there's Jerusalem's, whatever. These are really good, righteous people. What about you? It's oftentimes when I'm either counseling somebody or someone comes to me, I say, look, I don't need to know other people's names. Uh, I don't need to know anyone else who's involved. In it. You're the one standing here. Let's just talk about you and your sin. Well, no, I want to talk about what someone did to me. I go, they're not here. Uh, that's, let's just talk. What about you? We see the same thing. Now, this is the last six months of Jesus' life. And very at the end of his life, Jesus, we know in the Gospel of John, tells Peter how he's going to die. And then Peter says the question, if you know your Bible, he says, well, what about him? What about John? And Jesus gives them that statement. He says, what does it matter if John stays alive till I return? What is that to you? You follow me. You do that which is required of you. And so that is the question here. And by the way, many of the starving people groups, they have the gospel. They've, they've been preached the gospel. There's still a lot of unmet, uh, unreached people groups, but uh, the majority of people, uh, again, in some of the countries have been met. India is still a huge, huge, 250 different dialects. Uh, there's still many of unreached people groups there. But again, what does it matter? What does it matter? I, I am pretty belligerent now when I, when I get together and people are, uh, get this self-imposed false humility and we're sitting down and for Thanksgiving dinner, and I know this because I've done this before, and, and you know, I don't know if I can eat this of all the starving people. I wish there's something I can do. You know what I do now? I take your plate away from you. I wrap it up. I've got a FedEx package, and I put it in there. All right, I'm just, I'm going to wrap it up. We're going to send it to them. So no more food for you. You have a self-imposed uh, thing that, you know, you're on some hunger strike or something. So we're going to send this meal and now you have done something. And they're like, whoa. No, 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 no. No potatoes for you. <laughs> no, no, no. We're going to send there like... But that, that's... You laugh because that sounds ridiculous. And like, it, 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 it's an improbable statement. You, you're telling me at this point, this is the first time you've ever felt that about... The, there's something else going on in your life. And, it, and it's a religious statement. It's a hyper-spiritual statement meant to manipulate or feel, other people feel guilty. And you're already guilty about something else. All right? Now, I'm going to... I think I have a word of knowledge here. I think there's someone in this room who has sinned. Yeah. And if only I showed up, I would fulfill that word of knowledge here today. And, I, and the thing, what does it matter about all the others? Do you understand that you only have enough oil in your lamp, to use a metaphor, as, he's, as David Barton says, metaphor, but as you use a metaphor, of that this whole thing that, that even Jesus used about, there's only enough oil in my lamp for my light, for my salvation. There's only enough, you only have enough salvation for yourself. You can't save anyone else. And even the world gets this. Has anyone ever been on a plane? Anyone ever been on a plane? You ever flown on a plane? If the oxygen masks deploy, what are you supposed to do first? Put it up, put yours on. Why? Because then there'll be enough oxygen to maybe save somebody else. And, and, and you get to those things. Even the world knows that. I don't know why the airlines want you to be awake all the way to the crash site when God has given us the ability at high altitudes, if there's no oxygen, to just pass out. But the airlines. You paid full price. And they want you awake all the way down there. What about you? 
That's what Jesus... And again, there's all these hyper-spiritual questions, but the answer this really comes down to, what about you? What does it matter about the Christian next to you? What does it matter about the world around you? What does it matter about what they get or don't get or whatever? What about you and your relationship with the Lord? How does this pertain to you? And he says, unless you all, you dirty Galileans from the Gentile cities up in the north, and you religious, pious Jews here, what does it matter? You're all going to perish. You're all, unless you all repent. And so here, he says, I tell you, verse uh, 5, I tell you, uh, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Again, he, we only have one word for the word repent in the English language, and that word is? Now look, very good, excellent Bible students. But when you look into the, the Greek manuscript, and you find that there's two variations of the word repent here. The word one one of the word per, uh, words repent is uh, metanoia and it is to repent it means to make a U turn on the road of life, to make a one hundred and eighty degree turn on the road of life. Where the way you were going and you repent. But in verse five, he talks about this repentance about a con- and it means one of continually repenting, not repenting from dead from dead works. You can cross reference this with First John. First John is written to believers. And it says, if you confess your sins and repent, He'll forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Wait a minute. 1 John is written to Christians, to believers. What's that word if they're doing there? Well, there was a lot of foreknowledge of God and the Holy Spirit giving the writers what to say in the Bible. The, 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 the thing is that, that you might or whatever, you are going to sin after you accept Jesus Christ. The difference now is you have an advocate, you have someone you can go to. You're not left in the death that that sin brings. And then there could be a continual change. Here's the thing. You can have a changed life. He's not saying here, change your life. He's saying, repent. Or else you're going to perish. And you're going to be like everyone else. He's talking about this thing about repentance that you change. But here, many people have a changed life. Hare Krishnas, they have a changed life. Take someone who wasn't a Hare Krishna, they become a Hare Krishna. That's a changed life. Moonies and Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, they have changed lives. It isn't the fact that your testimonies can cancel one another out. Why are you Jehovah's Witnesses? Because it changed my life. Why are you a Christian? Because it changed my life. That's it. Your testimonies cancel each other out. There has to be something more than that. What is the outcome of your faith in? And for you and I as Christians, we can go much deeper than that. It is because of Jesus Christ that I have a changed life. And it's because of this relationship with Jesus Christ that my life is continually changing. That's why Paul tells us it's the love of God in 1 Corinthians. It's the love of God that constrains me from doing any evil. And then he tells us in 2 Corinthians, he says, it's the love of God that compels me to do good. He tells us again in 1 Corinthians, he talks about being daily conformed into the image of Christ. That conform, there's, there's a changing going on. When you're through changing, you're through. Stick a fork in you, it's over. When when there's nothing left to change, there is a continual chipping away. If God would have given me a, a, a list of all the sin that would be me getting rid of in my life over the course of now 28 years of being a Christian, there is no way I would have signed up for this gig. He says, by the way, you want to become a Christian? Here you go. There's things that I had discovered later in my walk, years in my walk, and I like, and then the conviction comes. And I go, oh, but I've been doing that for, I don't know how many years, whatever, or how many weeks or months, whatever. And God then shows it to you, well, that's sin for you. It might not be sin for others, but it's sin for you. That's why we talk about Jesus Christ being a personal Lord and Savior. Nowhere in the Bible does it say Jesus is your personal Lord and Savior. That's a terminology that you and I have come up because we're trying to identify something. That's how intimate Jesus Christ is with each and every one of us. If no one else was here, He'd be my personal Lord and Savior. And He still would be working on me and chipping away and showing me. But again, I'm more open to the change now. I'm more open to the repentance. I'm more open to those things because now there's been other things that I've dealt with over the course of my life, daily being conformed to the image of Christ. When God illuminates something to you, when God shows something to you, and you don't repent of it, and you don't turn away from it, well, then it's going to bring forth a spiritual death in your life. The cares of the world are going to begin to choke that out. But when He shows you those things, it used to be early on, oh, man, I've been doing that. I've been doing that for a few years. Okay, well, now you can handle that. 
When my pastor told me, when my first pastor told me that there'll come a time that I'll never crave drugs and alcohol again. I just thought, you know, it's my cross to bear. I'm just going to deal with, you know, 10 years of drugs and alcohol. And that's just something I'm just always going to struggle with in my walk. He says, no. He says, I I see what's happening in your walk. There's going to come a time that you're going to actually think being a drunk is better than what you have to deal with. What are you talking about? A couple years later. Yeah, I don't like anger, the lust, the temptation. I don't, I don't like the person I am. Why can't I be like the, the bumbling little drunk in our fellowship that everyone just bears up with the failings of the week? This guy just continually just struggles with alcohol. I know why now. I know why he struggles that. Because, you know what? Dealing with your anger and your vices and your relationships with others, well, that's why he did the drugs and the alcohol to escape all of that. Some people will just go and see 10 movies a day, pay for one entrance, and then go from multiplex to multiplex, all right? Yeah, all right, we're all there. All right, so I understand they'll just do whatever it is to escape and to get away from those things. And Jesus talks about us repenting, making that initial repentance, and us, we're all going to push, but unless you continually repent. There's that change that comes on, that knowing Jesus Christ. So, again, so what about you? Number one, what about you? Who cares about the Christian next to you, the liberties that they have or don't have or whatever? And you start looking and putting the spotlight on everyone else. When someone comes to you, let me equip you, Christian. Let me help you out. When someone comes to you complaining about someone else, just stop them. Just say, I don't want to hear about anybody else. What about you? doesn't matter what that person did or said. Or what was your response? People often ask me, so I don't know, when this thing's going to happen, what should I do? And I just simply say, well, what would Jesus do? What would be his response? Uh, sometimes people come up with uh, self imposed things. I said, no, I think that's more what you would do. Is there a precedent? Listen up, Christian. There is an answer for everything in life and godliness. When it comes to Jesus Christ and when it comes to your walk with the Lord, there, you do not have to live in gray and shades of gray and all that kind of stuff. You really can live black and white. And not legalistic. Not legalistic, self-imposed righteousness. But if, if you're looking for an answer, find a precedent. Find something that Jesus did. Find something that Jesus lived. It was done in the book of Acts. And it was incursed throughout the New Testament letters. Then here's a new word for you. Hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the science of the study of the Scriptures. If Jesus said it and did it, if it was done and encouraged throughout the book of Acts, and it's done and encouraged throughout the New Testament letters, epistles, then that's doctrine. That's a pretty good thing. And it's a pretty good thing because then you can look at hermeneutics. Why did the Apostle Paul only say to the Corinthian church that the women need to have their head covered? But he didn't say it to any other church. Well, then you find out the context of what was going on there the cultural things and the things that are happening there, and you find out why. Uh, again, don't be a one-verse Charlie or Charlotte. Don't, don't be that thing that, well, I've got this one verse, and that's when I'm going to do these things, because then, it becomes, then what happens is there gets this one verse, and there's this self-imposed self-righteousness that comes that I'm following this one little verse and doing these things. Man, that's how heresy happens. It starts with a little bit of truth, and man, then it just gets way off. So verses 6 through 9, Jesus says that, again, that he's been walking around for about three years, and he gives this illustration of the fig tree. Now we know the vineyard is a vineyard, and we know we study the fig tree. We see this whole nation of Israel thing that's going on. And, and again, he says in this parable, he says, and what is he likening it to? This is the whole thing. They ask him this question about who can be saved, or, or this question of, of like who's more righteous, or why do bad things happen to good people? I want you to understand right now, bad things happen to bad people, and we're all bad. It's a very freeing thought when you can accept the same thing the Apostle Paul says, in me is no good thing. That's why when Jesus says, you being evil, knowing how to give good gifts to your children, yes, you and I. Us being evil, and yet we know how to, you know, give good gifts to our children. Hey, look folks, I've studied through the history. Hitler didn't have, all his days were bad. He was capable of some kindness. Not a whole lot, but he was capable of it. So it was Genghis Khan, so was Hitler, so was Mussolini, so was, you know, Attila the Hun, so was... There are people who are capable, but when you say, you're trying to hang your hat on just, you know, one good day or things, you you have to look at the whole thing. there. So understand this, all of us are evil, and in me is no good thing. So that the thing that which is good should be Jesus Christ. That's the freeing thought. When we think that we're good. Even Jesus even said it. When they said, good teacher. He says, no one is good but God. They were trying to flatter him and butter him up. And no one's good but God. 
That's why the Apostle Paul can say, in me is no good thing. And yet, we've seen him do a lot of good things. A lot of churches planted. A lot of people come to know the Lord. And those are good things. But you're looking deep down in the core of the heart. From the mouth will flow the issues of the heart. So verses 6 through 9, he gives this parable of the fig tree. And again, Jesus now has already been around for three years. And this whole parable is like, look, he's looking and he's coming and he's looking for fruit. After three years... See, we look at this nation of Israel, and for three years Jesus has been walking around, and he's still continuing to look for fruit. What does he find? He finds the faith of the centurion. finds the faith of these Gentiles. And he incenses the, the religious Jews, because I've seen no greater faith than, than these. And he uses Samaritans, these half-breed Jews or Gentiles, and says, that's, that's what faith is. And they get incensed. Why? I can't believe you do. Say something like that. Here Jesus Christ says, look, but look at the grace in all this. He says, give it, give it another year. Give it another year. And, and that, that could be what's happening to each and every one of us right now. Could God be working and doing this? And He's coming and He's looking for fruit. And He's giving us another year. But then He says, there will become a final day. It will be cut down. We know Jesus, as He was teaching His disciples, about talking about bearing fruit, that a good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Thus, every tree that does not bear good fruit is what? Cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. I cannot judge any person's salvation here, but I can certainly inspect the fruit, according to Matthew 7. I can certainly look at the fruit and make some assessments and make some judgments that, again... God's Word never says not to judge. It says to just be careful how you judge. People say, hey man, the Bible says thou shalt not judge. You know that, that verse that they, they use in Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 says that they're quoting that, but yet He goes on to make seven more judgments. Don't judge. But by the way, I judge this, I judge that, I judge this, and I judge that. But other than that, don't judge. He's not saying do as I say, not as I do. No, he, be careful. For the same measure you measure will be measured back to you with the judgment you use will be judged back to you. Well, here's the problem with that. That's oftentimes why Christians won't confront one another or deal with one another biblically. As it tells us in Galatians chapter 6, 1 and 2, that if you see your brother and sister in a sin and a fault, you who are spiritual, go and restore them. Many Christians won't do that because why? They don't want to bring something up because then something might be up in their life. Look, we're all guilty. Here, let me give you some equipping here. When you're being confronted, take it. When you're being confronted or someone because they care about you and they're already nervous anyways, and so they're going to chunk it up and they're going to, you know, maybe they've been holding it back for a while and finally they just on you and you're like, okay, all right, I can uh, pick through the chunks there. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, hmm, that's what it is. And they're just nervous because they've been holding it and holding it in and they finally just, just take it. That is not the opportunity for you to bring up the issues that you have with them because then all that is is just defense. Then all of a sudden, one of you has to sacrifice to be the one to be confronted or the confrontee or whatever, something, all right? And if someone's already coming to you, you had your opportunity and you've been holding it in and holding it in. Usually what happens is you've got some issues with somebody, they come and confront you because they care about you or something like that, and then you unload on them. Well, wait a minute, how's any of it going to be dealt with? Deal with it one at a time. It's like a triage. You know, I've... uh, I've seen it in critical incidences of triage. They diagnose who's going to die, who's going to die. And they're like, you know what? This person's going to die. Just give them some morphine. This one's treatable. And they got... So when it comes to this conversation, this, this conversation or this time, if you're the one being confronted, just take it. And then later, if these issues need to arise with the other person, well, then you can talk to them at another time. But not at that time. That's even the same way when I teach when it comes to marriage counseling. You both have issues. Hi, you're both living together. You're both two selfish individuals. God puts together and goes, ha ha, be one. And you're going to work those things out? <laughs> and you have to take the turns. But yet when it's like, well, you do this. Well, you know what you do. That's just not the time. And so Jesus again puts it on to him. What about you? Gives this whole parable of the fig tree. And he comes and looks for fruit. And he says, give it another year. There's still grace there. But yet there will be a final day. We see that in in Genesis chapter 6. He gave people plenty of time to repent. But when that door was shut on the ark, no more can get in. And I'm sure there was a lot of screaming and yelling, We believe you now, Noah. Well, you, you had to get in before. 
And so here, verses 69, we see this. Look at chapter uh, 13, verses 10 through 17. We see this woman for 18 years is bent over in contortion. Look, before I go on with this, make no mistake, there are some infirmities that are demonic. And, and the foolish thing for you and I as Christians to not think that there are some physical things that don't happen because of demonic influences. And it would be just as foolish as to think that everything physical is from demonic presence. I had uh, someone, a, a, a spiritual, spiritual eye, Specs O'Keefe she was, and, and every time someone had phys- some physical infirmity, she says, well, maybe that's it. I, one, one Christian had a problem with her eye, and, and then she comes up to him and says, well, you know, maybe you have a problem spiritually seeing things. And man, that just wiped them out for a few weeks, man. So finally I got him confronted and said, what are you thinking? I mean, come on. And it just, you know, you got a sty in your eye. Let me get my pliers and I'll work this thing out, okay? (laughs) I'm just kidding. If you just take a hot needle and a, no. Uh, (laughs) Understand this, folks, that that it comes down to this whole thing that it would be foolish just to think that there are no physical infirmities. We don't see that a whole lot, but I've seen it uh, a whole lot here in the United States, but I've seen it a lot in other parts of the world. And there are things that people are into. Now look, this wasn't her whole life. It was for the last 18 years. 18 years that she was bent over because of some demonic thing. And Jesus still puts both his hands on her, touches her, and heals her. But look what happens. (laughs) This synagogue ruler stands up and says, (laughs) there are six days on which... Men ought to work, therefore come and be healed on them, and not on the Sabbath day. Again, another indictment. If you were really God, God created the Sabbath. Healing for God is work, and you can't be of God because you're working on the Sabbath. This is their whole mentality, man. They're like this. They're still upset. The question is, has there ever been a miracle? Has this ever happened before? Have you ever really seen anyone get healed and delivered and... No, and you're arguing that it happens on the Sabbath, and then Jesus goes on to tell them in verse 15, Then the Lord answered him and said, Hypocrite! Well, wait a minute. That's not very Minnesota nice. I mean, it might offend their feelings or whatever. I mean, I hear that a lot when it comes to you sharing your faith, and you know, you got to be so nice and polite. You've got to be so nice and polite because you can really offend people and stuff like that if you want to bring people to the Lord. Well, here's the Lord yelling at them. You're a hypocrite. What did we read in the last couple of chapters? You're an heir of Scripture. Totally confronting him and outing the guy right in front of everybody because this one, the self-imposed theologian, is saying, well, it's this way. And Jesus goes, no, you're an heir of Scripture. You're totally wrong. Well, wait a minute. This guy's professor or whatever, you know, Commander McBragg, something. He's, he's got all of that and he's, he's good to go. And yet Jesus confronts him and says, no, you're great. Not, not only are you an heir of Scripture, but you are greatly an heir of Scripture. You're off. You're not even left field. You're so out of the field. You're in another park. You're not even around here. And Jesus calls him and just says, You hypocrite. Do not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his donkey? Didn't you, before coming to synagogue, didn't you release them to go out into pasture? Because, see, there's not supposed to be any work on the Sabbath. Didn't you do that on the way here? I'm going to make a bold statement here. I don't think we should be cruel to animals. Understand that, okay? I do believe PETA is for people eating tasty animals, but I don't think you have to be cruel to them and torture them before we eat them. But understand this. God values human life over the animal life. A dog in the road, you in the road, the dog's a goner, all right? All right? I might even not even put on the brakes. I'm not going to swerve or whatever and stuff like that. There is a difference between a dead snake in the road and a dead lawyer in the road. Usually there's skid marks before the snake. But understand this. You had one of those too, huh? All right. What you have here is that Jesus is already telling them, says, So ought this, not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound? Think of it. Jesus is like, look, you hypocrite. Think of it. Isn't this daughter of Abraham? We're not even talking a Gentile. We're talking a daughter of Abraham who Satan has bound for 18 years. Shouldn't she be loosed? Shouldn't she be? 
well, not on the Sabbath. Do you think that woman who's been bound for 18 years goes, I wait one more day, not a problem. <laughs> Get my evening later. I'm okay, <clears throat> you're right. I don't want to... I don't want to offend anybody here. I'm sorry, I'm bleeding. I have an open sucking chest wound. I'll come back in a more convenient day. I mean, we're laughing at this, but this is the scene. You know, he's already ridiculed. You know, you could heal on all these other days and you have to do it on this day. And then he just, I mean, Jesus totally sets him up. And I, it's even in my own life. Jesus just, you know, you, when you get so caught up in your tradition, and look, we can be non denominational, but we can be very traditional in things. It's got to happen a certain way. It's got to be doing these things. And we can kind of, you know, the way our gang functions here on certain things or whatever. And we can get, so I got, and we can do this whole self imposed thing, thinking that's pleasing to God or pleasing to the, the pastor or the leadership of the church or doing these things. And, and it's this self imposed thing that, that, that myself or God or anyone has, hasn't opposed it. We bring that in with us. Where, where did that come from? I'm constantly debugging the fellowship. What rules now are out there that I never even said? Well, I think Chick would be this way, and I think he would be that way, and you don't ever... You know, I have a thing that I talk with people who are doing ministry and stuff like that. Don't, don't talk to me on Sundays about ministry. Do your ministry and stuff like that. But, but somehow that's translated over, don't ever talk to Chick on Sunday because that'll get in the way of the ministry. People who have come in and would have needs or whatever says, well, i got some needs, I want to talk to the pastor. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't talk to Chick on Sunday or Thursdays because, you know, he's got to do the ministry. And he's... Uh... No, no, no. I'm saying, look, you who are ministry leaders, talking to me five minutes before service when you've had a week, when you know, when you know Sundays, it's going to happen every week. Every seven days, Sunday's going to show up, and every seven days, Thursday's going to show up on those days of ministry. It, don't wait till five minutes before that time in ministry to try to solve the problem when you've had a whole week to get on those things. You're just going to have to deal with it now. But I don't want to deal with that now because why? Because there are people who come on the Sundays and Thursdays and wait for those days, and they hey, I need to pray with you, I need to talk with you. I'm like, that's the ministry. But no, 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 keep them, keep them away. And I'm just like, where did that come from? I'm constantly, see, those are the things that can be misconstrued. And, and so the same thing here. They try to keep the children away from Jesus. Keep, don't, don't bother me, kid, get away. And the blind man, Jesus, have mercy on me, son of David. Shh, the Lord's teaching. <laughs> what does he do? Hey, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Oh. Man, can someone get rid of the blind guy? <laughs> Take him by the hand. This is going to blow our gig. Hey, I'll do it for Jesus. I'll do it for Jesus. And he's just busy ministering to the people who can see. And uh, But you understand, we laugh because, yeah, myself and you included, we, we do these self-imposed things that are tradition. And Jesus is coming against all this tradition. And when he said these things, look, she should be loosed. And he loosed her. He goes, and again, we've seen other healings. Jesus isn't into formulas. With the lepers, He cleansed them, but they, when they walked away, came the healing. Others, He spit and put mud in their eyes, and some He just spit on, and some of the others He kissed, and some of the others... And here He put both hands on this woman, right in front of Him, on the Sabbath! And healed her and touched her. You see, it goes all the way back. You know, what evil did she do? Even His disciples, when they come in with one blind man who got in the way... They, they said, well, who sinned, this, this man or his parents? And Jesus looked at him and says, neither. Neither. This is that so the glory of God could be revealed. And so here, same thing is going on. So this satanic thing, she needs to be loosed. And then he goes on, again, he's talking about this hypocrisy. Then verses 18 through 21 talks about this mustard seed tree. This is something you have to understand. There are no mustard seed trees. They're bushes. They don't grow. There is something abnormal or supernaturally happening with the growth of this that it turns out to be a tree. If you're taking notes, this is what we call expositional consistency. In other words, God has come up with a language. How can you understand me? Because somewhere along the line, someone taught you English. I am thoroughly convinced the reason why it takes kids so long to actually verbalize and speak the English tongue is because we say ba ba and wah wah and pee pee, and that's what oh, ba ba, wah wah, and that's what they do. Maybe talk to them in full sentences and see what happens. Their first word is still going to be no. But there's a form of communication that's going on here 
And the same thing with expositional consistency. You can cross-reference this all the way back to Daniel chapter 4. The mustard seed is the littlest of the seeds, seeds, and it grows into a bush, but this abnormal or supernatural thing. And he says, what shall I like in the kingdom of God? Well, and he's saying, look, this is how it should be, but this thing grows up supernaturally. What do we already know about the birds? They're evil. They're the birds, the same birds that are used in, in uh, Daniel chapter uh, 4, are the same birds that Jesus talks about in John, where they come and they swoop up the seeds that is planted in the field of someone's heart, and they come and they, they're, they're, they're evil. So this with expositional consistency, we can look at this parable, and what is he saying? The same thing can happen, and has happened, in the church right now. There's an unnatural and a supernatural growth, and it can grow so large that birds, the evil things, can come and rest in it. And don't think that that can't happen to this church. It already has happened, but don't think that can happen to the church universal. The church universal has killed people over the Word of God. Tyndale was killed by supposed church leaders because he translated from Latin into English the Bible. And he was considered a heretic. Christopher Columbus was considered a heretic because he wanted to go preach the gospel around the whole world. And he dared to say that the world was not flat, which was the prevailing science of that day. Science finally caught up with God. And the world is round because he said in the Bible it talks about the earth being a sphere. And what is a sphere? And he knows these things. And if there's people on the other side of the world and he's got them there, then they need to know about the good news of Jesus Christ. Don't believe the revisionist history that they just wanted to rape and pillage the country and the, and the world and bring smallpox and kill off nations of people. I think the Native Americans are rethinking their immigration policy now at this point. But, but before then, Christopher Columbus wanted to preach the gospel. You read his autobiography. I've been reading it lately, so that's why I kind of know some of the stuff about that. But he calls them these hypocrites. And then he goes on to give these parables and these examples. And again, we know that the birds equal sin and they're evil. And we can see this. There are evil people who come and rest in the church. Just this weekend, watching uh, 48 hours of a minister who wanted to get rid of his wife, and he kills her. And then he's denying it all along, and then finally his mistress comes clean. A girl in his church that he says, you know, it's okay to date your pastor. I'm going to get rid of my wife. And they show the emails and all this stuff. And this guy's guilty. This guy's a, a minister. Then if that's not the bad, uh, worse off, then I'm watching America's Most Wanted, you know, uh, in between study and time. I'm watching uh, on Saturday, watching America's Most And there's a cult leader, this guy, and all the things they do in the church, and they're raising up the Bible and stuff. There are evil people. There is this heresy, this health and wealth gospel that still is around. God wants you healthy and well. Well, praise God that those people who are the founders of that are dying off. Because they can, you know, what is it? He just had the symptoms of death. Really not dead. I mean, what else can he claim there? When the leaders like Kenneth Hagin and Copeland check themselves into hospital under assumed, under assumed names, so they won't. If, if Oral Roberts is such this great faith healer, why do you have an Oral Roberts University hospital? Shouldn't it be just check in, show your insurance card, healed, and you're out, and a quick coin for that? I mean, there's these oxymoronic things that are these statements there. And, and now, after 20 years, I'm watching all these people that they have these certain doctrines. Look, we live in a fallen world. I am going to be with the Lord someday, and I can tell you, being 48, 47 years old, some of me have already gone up ahead, and it's waiting for me. There are some things I've already given up in my body that are waiting for me there. There are those who will come into the church, and they'll rest in it. And there's an unnatural, or there's a supernatural growth that happens. People come into the Lord in this body of Christ. But what does He liken it to? And then he goes on to leaven. Leaven is always sin. I understand this about leaven. It corrupts. It doesn't just puff up. It corrupts. It's corruption. The leaven of the Pharisees, Jesus is always warning about. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. You're supposed to get all the leaven out of the house. Leaven corrupts. That's how it, it permeates it. But yet I have heard... I've read the commentaries of others who've taken this passage and saying that's the church of Jesus Christ. And, and, this, and there's this strange theology that's still around called the dominion theology. That the church is going to get so big it's going to usher in the kingdom of God because we're going to have such a righteous, perfect life and we're going to root out sin. Why is that still around? You know, the murder rates are still going up from city to city. I have never once seen in my 47 years of life, I've never seen where this world has once ever gotten better. 
I've never seen wars where they've ended like, you know what, we were wrong. Sorry about that. You can have your stuff back. And I've never, <laughs> I've never seen that. So we see that they're going to come and they're going to rest. Verses 20 through, through 30. To what shall I liken the kingdom is like leaven. And, and, or, and again, this leaven, this puffs up. Verse 22. He went through the cities and the villages teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. He's on his way to Jerusalem to die for yours and I sin. Back in verse 17. Why were the people rejoicing? Because of all the marvelous and wonderful things that Jesus was doing. The evidence of his relationship with his father was there. That's what people need to rejoice over us. That they may see our good deeds and our works and then what? Glorify our Father in heaven. We are not to be doing our good deeds. Some people get this false sense of spirituality or, uh, or humility that they can't be seen doing whatever, whatever. Because then, they... No, look, if you're going to be seen, make sure they give glory to God. It's wrong when we're trying to do works of righteousness and do these things that God commands us to do and desires for us to do and then we take the glory for it. That's wrong. But if we're out there living our lives and, and Jesus is the Lord and Savior of our lives, we're going to be doing good works. We're going to be doing those things. But he talks about that of one of, to make sure that you enter in through that narrow gate. Because why is it narrow? Because there's others trying to squeeze in. The Mormons are trying to get in. The Jehovah's Witnesses are trying to. There's many people blocking the gate. And it's a narrow gate. And he tells us here in verses 22 uh, through uh, 30 that he's traveling. Verse 24, strive to enter... The narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will abide. They'll try to get in. But he says, look, those are going to try to get in. They're going to try by their good works. And they're going to do all these things. And you look at this passage here. This isn't the first time Jesus has said this. He told this teaching to his disciples. And now he's out preaching it to others. He says, many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons? Lord, Lord, don't you know me? He says, hey man, you've casted out demons. That's the signal for you to go to the microphone. There you go. All right. And then, didn't we do all these things in your name? And he turns around and tells them, I never knew you. Away from me, you workers of iniquity. But they did a lot of good things. They'd gone to church. They... All these things. And that's why he's saying strive to enter and not strive. And then the word strive in the Greek language, again, the New Testament was written in the Greek language, the modern language of the day. It means to agonize. Not suffer, but there's others who are blocking and you've got to get through that narrow gate and you've got to be on that straight path. And you can do many good things, but that's not going to help you when you stand before the Father. I've asked uh, Benjamin here to give a, a testimony about this. And um, go ahead and share, brother. Volume. Okay. Um, so I was raised by my parents and my sisters and went to a really good, solid, Bible-believing church. Um, you know, much like Calvary Chapel St. Paul. They had rules. Some of them I discovered I could get around and other ones I couldn't. But uh, my senior year of high school, I was able to get out of going to church and I took it. Didn't really change a whole lot, still watched a lot of TV and actually managed to watch a little bit more. It was also during my senior year of high school that I decided to go to college for photography. And also during my senior year, I realized um, that there were some things that while I wanted to go to college for those things, I also realized that I shouldn't go for that those things and, because they were bad for me um, and potentially toxic to my health. So I decided that all these things, some of them are really probably pretty obvious why you go to college, some of them not so obvious. I put them aside and continued to um, just live my life. And then the day before our classes started, my senior year high school, or in college, I realized that there is a God and that I should go to church. I found a small little church in the northwest suburbs and was active there. You know, I was hanging out with the guys, going to Bible studies, uh, active with missions. Uh, I even started a Bible study. You know, so there's all these things that I was doing that was really good. And it wasn't until I moved in uh, to an apartment off of Wiper Avenue and I found Sojourner's Cafe. The first person I recall meeting there 
invited me to come back the next week to an anniversary party and said there's going to be free food. I looked at him and thought to myself, free food? Seriously? You just met me and you're inviting me here for free food. You know, I decided I was going to take him up on it because why should I deny free food, right? <laughs> but I did the Minnesota nice thing. I thought to myself, well, they don't know me. I don't really have the right to be here, so I can't get free food. So I intentionally showed up late, waited until I was certain that nobody else wanted any food that was there. Then I went through and I was like, all right, well, there's still plenty of this, so I can have some of this, but there's not a lot of that, so I need to leave that alone, even though I really want some. I know this to be a calorie chapel no-no. <laughs> if, if you're at a party and you're hungry, eat and enjoy yourself. Just have fun. You know, but it, hanging out at Sojourners, it ended up that I would be there with the guys and they would encourage me and rebuke me according to scripture, which is something I was taught my entire life. And I like, this is interesting. You know, so these guys are living this. And I started coming and wanted to join the intern program because I thought to myself, well, hey, you know, there's this intern program. This is what you know, people who are in leadership are doing. So I go there. I'll you know, learn the doctrine of Calvary Chapel St. Paul. I'll learn the words to use and hopefully be able to fit in really well. I ended up not joining right away. It was a little bit later. But um, about halfway through, or sorry, about four months into coming to Calvary Chapel St. Paul, I started a program called Personal Witness Training. It was about halfway through this that a uh, guy I was sitting with, a brother, he told me that there's, he'd never heard me say that there was a time when I had accepted Christ as my Savior. Right here, I knew I was busted because, you know, I've, I'd been living my life good, and in my mind, I was saved. And up until this point, I never questioned it. But as soon as he said it, I realized that I needed a Savior. And I realized that all the good stuff I did really didn't matter if Jesus wasn't my Savior. This was also really hard because if I was wrong, then that meant that I was wrong about heaven and hell. And that really scared me. Um, and, you know, so it came down to the fact that I had been following Christ as my Lord for three years before that. And it was that night that I admitted the fact that I needed Christ as my Savior. And we all need Christ as both our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Thank you. I asked that night at personal witness training, as we were going through a few weeks of it, and, and I teach a couple of questions. Does your relationship with God make you sure you'll go to heaven when you die? And what would you say God's requirements are for you to get into heaven? I said, now, you haven't gone through the whole program, but has anyone here had an opportunity to leave one, someone to the Lord with those questions? And Benjamin raised his hand and goes, I did. I go, who? And he goes, me. <laughs> what? Yeah. Very good. Very good. So, he was his first convert. How, were you, have you been discipling him well? Yes. All right. Very good. Because we always say, lead one person to Christ and disciple him. So very good. All right. Well, there, there lies the case, folks. You could be, and Benjamin was a very good guy, very good guy, very polite, didn't eat a whole lot around us, but very, very polite. And uh, now he's uh, saved, and uh, I think he's gained 40 pounds. I don't sure, but uh, he's, he's well at the feast there. But uh, understand this, that that is, again, in verse 23 of, of Luke 13, they've asked, then, are, just, are there just a few saved? Can just a few be saved? And then Jesus goes on to talk about there's many who think that they are. There's many who think that they're doing the righteous things. Many who think they're all these things. But man, to, I'm, I'm praising God that Benjamin's here today and, he, and he's saved and he's walking with the Lord. But here's a guy that, just an example of that. He could stand before the Lord and I've said, I've done all these things. I've started Bible studies. People could have gotten saved at the Bible studies because they're reading God's word. But yet Jesus could look at him and says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Iniquity, workers of iniquity. What do you mean? Because even though you're doing these good things, if it's not in Jesus' name, if it's not by the power of the Holy Spirit, it's just a work of iniquity. That's all it is. And so here, these are the statements of Jesus. And they will be thrown out and they'll be where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Like the one quote I heard says, what about the people who don't have teeth? 
How will they be weeping and gnashing in teeth? Here's this one pastor respond, teeth will be provided. <laughs> if there's going to be weeping and gnashing in teeth, teeth will be provided. You've got a great dental program there. But verse 29, they will come from the east and the west and from the north and the south and they will sit down in the kingdom of God. It's not just you, Israel. That many are going to come to know the Lord and they're going to come from all over. And this tree, not this bush, but this tree is going to grow. And yet there are going to be people who come in who are evil about it. Paul even tells us this in Acts chapter 19. He says, even after my departure, I tell you, even with much tears, there's many savage wolves who will who are already in the body of Christ, who will come and tear this apart, seeking to bring men to lead them after themselves. And so here, in verse 31, and on that very same day, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get out and depart, for that Herod wants to kill you. There's no sincerity of that. Just get out of here, Jesus. Jesus turns around and says, Tell that fox that I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and I'm going to be here tomorrow, I'm going to go on the next day. That word fox in the Greek language is vixen. Call him a female fox. Doesn't call him a lion, because remember, Satan is like a roaming lion seeking who may devour. He says, tell that vixen. I mean, he's, he's, he's slamming him. You know, there's a play on words. If you don't realize this, during the uh, first Gulf War in 91, uh, President Bush at that time used to pronounce Saddam Hussein's name, Saddam. And you think, well, it's just his Texas drawl or whatever, or, or his New England speech were there. No, no, no. He was very poignant in that because he knew Saddam Hussein was watching CNN all the time. And he would say, Saddam. Saddam means like a bootlash, a black bootlash. He knew exactly what he was calling him. All well, the rest of it just looks, oh, he's just a little ignorant there. He can't say it right. And Jesus knows exactly what he's saying. He's not just doing a play on words here and a mistake. He says, tell that deceitful little fox. And again, you might see that lion. And that's what sometimes people wait for in their walk with the Lord. The lion. And oh, I can you know, do whatever. I'll be like David and we'll conquer you and do all this stuff. And, but Solomon tells us it's those little foxes that get into the vineyard. That chew it and re- eat the roots. And that's really what brings destruction. Tell that little vixen. Tell that little female fox to say, hey, I'm going to be here. It, he can't do anything to me. And I'll keep doing this and doing this and doing this until it is my appointed time. And then he goes on to tell them, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How I want to, how I wanted to gather you, gather your children together as a hen gathers her, her brood under her wings that you were not willing. That's the whole part. You weren't willing. As we finish up here this morning, you weren't willing you see, number one, what about you? What about you? Who cares about the person next to you? What about you and your relationship with the Lord? Number two, who can be saved? The first shall be last and the last shall be first. They will come. But what about you? And number three, prophecy being fulfilled here. Verse 35 says, See, your house is left to you desolate, and surely I say to you, you will not see me again until the time comes when you said, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We know that later to be fulfilled again in Matthew 21. We know that as a near fulfillment. Matthew 21, verse 9, he does come into Jerusalem. They say, Blessed is he who comes in the Lord. But he's also talking about this future fulfillment until Israel calls out to me and asks for me to come back. That's going to happen with the nation of Israel after the tribulation. They are going to call out and they will be calling out for Jesus. But this whole thing about a chicken... Now, this thing about chicken, we have this oxymoron. We always said, hey, you know, when someone uh, said, blows it and does a real you know, dumb maneuver, you go, great move, Einstein. But Einstein was pretty intelligent. Shouldn't we, when someone gets an A in report, go, hey, Einstein? But uh, I guess we don't, all right? So, but you have the same thing we call something. You're nothing but a chicken. Come to find out something about chickens. Pretty fierce little animal. They taste like chicken, too, but... <laughs> But when the chicken hawks are flying around, and there's a little chick out there, and the, the mama chicken, they'll run and cover their chicken, their little brood right there. This whole thing about they're a pretty fierce little animal. Tastes good, but they're fierce, all right? And so, again, I don't know if I'm going to change culture. We'll still hey, you chicken, you know, but, but Jesus has the right context of it. He's wanted to gather them together and protect them. This chicken will give up her own life, allow herself to get picked up by the chicken hawks so that her brood can live will actually run to another location and fake dead so the chicken hawk will come down and leave her nest alone. Jesus is using that. We even sing that song today, Under the Shadow of Your Wings. That's where I want to dwell. 
And so here he says, your house will be left to you desolate. Understand this, that it's about you and your relationship with God, that you need to have a relationship with God. Does your relationship with God here today make you sure that you'll go to heaven when you die? And just like Jesus is saying here, I'm not talking about the person next to you. I'm talking to you. Does your relationship with God make you sure that you'll go to heaven when you die? Who can be saved? All those who call upon the name of the Lord. If you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. But the prophecy will be fulfilled that the nation of Israel... We'll call out in the name of Jesus, but let's look at it for you and I as we leave here this morning. If you don't call upon Him, you will be left desolate. Your house, your body, your life, your soul. You can have a saved soul in a wasted life. You need to call out upon the name of Jesus Christ and receive Him and His gift that He's just six months away from our Scripture reading right here from paying the ultimate price and laying down His life. The house was left desolate in 70 A.D. Jerusalem was sacked. It was destroyed and the temple is gone. And there will be a third temple being rebuilt just as prophecy has been foretold. And it will happen. But yet, don't let your house be left desolate. If you walk with Him, you can do this on your own. Read Leviticus chapter 26. The promise He made to the children of Israel. If you walk after Me and follow after Me, you're going to get your socks blessed off. Well, that day and age, your sandals blessed off. But if you choose to walk contrary to me, I'm going to lay things desolate in your life. They're not going to work. Matthew 21, verses 41 through 44, talks about whoever falls upon the rock shall be broken, but whomever the rock falls upon shall be smashed. What side of the rock do you want to be on? And and again, that squeeze play of the Lord. God loves you enough that He'll come after you. Will you please stand with me and let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that You are the Lord and Savior of our lives here today. Lord, if there be any here that don't know You as Savior, Lord, that they would choose You today, that You are a good and gracious God, that You are, again, looking at that fig tree and You're looking for fruit and You're still giving us an opportunity. But Lord, those days will be cut short and that there will be an end and there will be a final day. So Lord Jesus, that there would be no one here today whose house would be left desolate, that Lord, that they need to call upon You. Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. That, God, that you forgive sin when we ask you. And that, Lord, that you redeem us. Lord, for all of us here that do have that relationship with you, that makes us sure that we'll go to heaven when we die. Lord, may we just be encouraged and equipped that much more today, knowing that you and how much you love us, and then in turn how we can just live that life of gratitude, that daily we can be conformed into your image. We praise you, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen?